In the last video, we saw that groups that are exchanged by symmetry elements have special stereotopic relationships. In this video, we're going to formalize this test for determining stereotopic relationships based on symmetry elements, and look at some computational resources for studying symmetry. One issue that we haven't yet discussed when it comes to symmetry elements is the problem of conformation. Some conformations are more symmetric than others, and how do we know which conformation to look at when deciding what the symmetry elements of a molecule are. Consider the case of the molecule shown here, which we know isn't really shaped like this. The compound is really a mixture of two chair conformations. But the two chair conformations are enantiomeric, and so in any sample of the compound, we'll have 50% this chair conformer and 50% this chair conformer. Keep in mind also that the barrier to interconversion of these chair conformers is relatively low, especially with respect to the rates of reactions of the two hydroxyl groups. So if we're interested in the stereotopic relationship between the hydroxyl groups, because these are enantiomeric chair conformers and they're interconverting rapidly, we can think of the structure on the time scale of chemical reactions as being the average of the two enantiomeric conformations, which corresponds to this flat cyclohexane structure that we usually see. It's okay to use this to determine stereotopic relationships because with respect to the processes we're interested in, namely chemical reactions of the hydroxyl groups, the average is the structure of the molecule, in a sense. What incoming group C is the average of the two chair conformations. And so when considering stereotopic relationships, we can average out enantiomeric conformations, meaning we don't really have to worry about conformation in detail. We can use simpler drawings like this to deduce stereotopic relationships. Thinking about the average conformation will also often lead to the most symmetric situation. Consider, for example, the molecule shown here, which lacks a plane of symmetry as drawn. However, we can rotate around the central carbon-carbon bond so that one of the conformations does have a plane of symmetry. If we rotate so that the carbon-oxygen bonds are aligned, now the molecule does have a plane of symmetry running right through the middle of it. However, this alternative conformation is an eclipsed conformation. It's not the most stable conformer of this molecule. However, like the cyclohexane case, it is the average of two enantiomeric staggered conformations. And because interconversion between those staggered conformations is rapid, remember rotation around single bonds is very rapid, it's okay to judge stereotopic relationships using this eclipsed conformation. In this case, and in many others, it's going to make our lives easier to put the molecule in its most symmetric conformation with enantiomers averaged out. This makes it very easy to see the plane of symmetry possessed by the molecule. Of course, in this particular case, the most stable staggered conformer possesses inversion symmetry. And so it doesn't matter whether we use the most symmetric conformer or the most stable conformer to determine the relationship between the hydroxyls. In both cases, we would come to the conclusion that they're enantiotopic. The main point of this discussion is just that it's totally fine to use the typical flat or even eclipsed conformer drawings that we find in simple Lewis structures to judge stereotopic relationships. Since conformational differences are averaged out on the time scale of chemical reactions, which is really why we're interested in determining these relationships between groups in a molecule. After placing the molecule in its most symmetric conformation with enantiomers averaged out, we want to look for symmetry elements in a specific order to identify stereotopic relationships, focusing on those that exchange the groups of interest. We first look for rotational symmetry, axes of symmetry, followed by planes of symmetry, and finally, as a last resort, inversion centers. If we find that an axis of rotational symmetry exchanges the groups, as it does in this case, a C2 axis, then the groups of interest are homotopic. If we don't find a rotational axis of symmetry that exchanges the groups, we then move to looking for a plane of symmetry. If a plane of symmetry exchanges the groups, but not a rotational axis, the groups of interest have an enantiotopic relationship. If we find that no plane of symmetry of the molecule exchanges the groups, we then look for an inversion center. If an inversion center of symmetry exchanges the groups of interest, then the groups are also enantiotopic. If we reach the end of this process 
and we've seen that no rotational axis of symmetry, plane of symmetry, or inversion center exchanges the groups in question, but we're sure that they have the same connectivity, then the relationship between the groups is diastereotopic. As an example of this, consider the cyclopentane molecule that I'm drawing here. This molecule has no symmetry elements. It's completely asymmetric. So clearly then, no symmetry element can exchange the two methyl groups since the molecule as a whole lacks symmetry elements. But the two methyl groups have the same connectivity, and as a consequence, we can conclude that they share a diastereotopic relationship. As we've seen for other tests involving the identification of symmetry elements, it's important here to be careful when applying the symmetry element test to identify stereotopic relationships. If you miss a symmetry element, or if you identify a symmetry element that's not really there, you may be led to an incorrect conclusion. For example, if you miss that a molecule has a rotational axis of symmetry, you might conclude that two groups are diastereotopic when they're actually homotopic. If you see a plane of symmetry in a molecule that isn't really a plane of symmetry, in the sense that it changes the appearance of the molecule in some way, you may conclude that two groups exchanged by that plane are enantiotopic, when in fact they're diastereotopic. If you want to get really good at applying the symmetry elements test, then it's very important to practice with symmetry. The good news is that there are a number of computational resources on the web available to study symmetry. The Symmetry at Otterbein website is great if you want an introduction to the symmetry elements or you just want to study them in more detail. And it's great for visualization because you can actually click on symmetry elements, see them, and see how the operations occur to move atoms around. The tutorial is broken up by the different types of symmetry elements, and for each one, a simple molecule or set of molecules is given with different examples of that symmetry operation. For example, for reflection, the molecule ammonia here has three planes of symmetry. We can check the box next to one of those to display it, and then clicking the button next to the symmetry element actually moves the atoms in accordance with this symmetry operation. So watch what happens when I click the reflect button. As we would expect, the atoms move into the reflection plane and out the other side at an equal distance. That's reflection. This tutorial covers everything from the identity, which involves doing nothing and is needed for having a complete system of symmetry operations, all the way through the different types of rotations, which are beyond the scope of Chem 2311. If you're familiar with the symmetry elements on some level, but you just want additional practice identifying them in molecules, the gallery is a large collection of molecules, both organic and inorganic, with all of their symmetry elements and operations displayed. For example, if we click the molecule 1,2-dibromobenzene, its symmetry elements appear automatically on the right-hand side, and as we can in the tutorial, we can check a box next to each one to display it, and then click the button next to the symmetry operation to actually run it to see how the atoms move. A second resource that's highly useful for studying symmetry is JMOL. Using the file get mole option and searching by name, we can pull in almost any molecule that's known and get a fairly accurate three-dimensional molecular model of the structure. You can practice identifying symmetry elements within these structures by themselves, and to test your knowledge, you can use the draw point group option, which automatically draws and labels all of the symmetry elements within the model shown. So we can see here, for example, the different planes of symmetry within cyclohexane as the yellow circles in blue outline, and the different rotational axes in orange. One thing I would caution you on with respect to using JMOL to determine symmetry elements is that it's very strict about how it treats different conformations. And so where you might expect a plane of symmetry, for example running right through the middle of this molecule, cyclohexanol, JMOL may not identify that as a symmetry element if things aren't aligned perfectly. So here the oxygen-hydrogen bond is aligned incorrectly to be within a plane of symmetry of this molecule. However, deleting that atom so that the molecule is now perfectly symmetric and rerunning draw point group gives us the expected plane of symmetry in cyclohexanol. So you may need to play around a little bit with conformation or delete atoms in order to make expected symmetry elements appear.